Welcome to the Audacity to Podcast, episode 68, podcasting stuff you must get right the first time. Welcome back to another episode of the Audacity to Podcast. I'm your host, Daniel J. Lewis, and this is a how-to podcast about podcasting and using Audacity. This is where I teach you the tools and give you the guts to podcast with passion, organization, and dialogue. You can check out the website and all of the past episodes over at theaudacitytopodcast.com. Subscribe over there, send feedback, all of that stuff. And show notes for today's episode will be at the audacity to podcast.com slash 68. I have some cool stuff for you today. Now, whether you are a beginning podcaster or a seasoned podcaster, this is important for you to know. Some of it might be a little painful for you to hear, especially if you've been doing this for a while and you've made these mistakes, but hopefully it won't be too bad and it will be something that can help you the next time. And someday we can work together to find some solutions for this. I'm talking about stuff that you have to get right the first time. Stuff that's hard to fix if you've been podcasting for a while and realize you've been doing it wrong. What can you do to fix these things? Some of these can kind of be fixed. Some of them can't after you've started. So it's really important that you get this right the first time. Now, a lot of this stuff can also apply to blogs. So if you start a blog, many of these things do work, except you'll know which ones aren't applicable to a blog because it's very specific to a podcast. So let's get into this. The first one of these 14 items, well, I'll say 13 and the 14th is a recommendation, but of these items, number one is control your RSS feed. This is the most important thing for a podcaster or blogger to do in the beginning of it. Because the RSS feed is the lifeblood of your blog or podcast. This is how people subscribe to you. They receive updates to you. And podcasting, this is what podcasting is all about. See, on a blog, yes, you can have a blog and people can come to your blog, visit your website listen to your podcasts. They might subscribe via email or whatever. But if you have a podcast, the primary way that people get podcasts are through subscriptions and subscriptions are powered by an RSS feed. You must have control over that RSS feed. Even if you have your own website or you're using a free service like wordpress.com or blogger.com Or if you pay for some premium service that gives you all of these things all packaged into one thing, you absolutely must have control over your RSS feed. The best way that you can do this is to use FeedBurner. Now, I know instantly the thing that you're probably thinking is, well, FeedBurner is another service. So I'm giving Google, who now owns FeedBurner, control over my RSS feed. Yes, but no. Here's the thing that you, when you use Google's FeedBurner service, you have all of these tools at your disposal, and it's a third-party service that can then work to give you all of the control that you need over your feed. Even if you decide to leave Google FeedBurner, they have methods in place to properly redirect people somewhere else where you want them to go if you decide to leave FeedBurner. So if you put your RSS feed into Google, they're not going to control it for the rest of your life if you don't want them to. But you have control over it. They're just hosting it for you. It's just like when we say that it's best for you to have your own website that's going to be hosted somewhere like Bluehost or HostGator or Site uh, Site 5 or one of those. And by the way, I have affiliate links for each of those if you're interested. But You have full control over the website, but it's on someone else's server. So do you really have full control? You have as much full control as you really need. They're the ones providing the service that gives you full control. That's what Google and FeedBurner does for you is they provide the service that gives you 
full control. Even though they own the service, you still have full control. So the reason why this is so important is let's let's look at a typical scenario. If someone decides they want to start a podcast, so they start over at wordpress.com and they start their podcast over there. Wordpress.com is very limited in what you can do, plugins that you can use or not use at all, and how it can work with podcasting. But if you start out at wordpress.com, maybe your website address is mypodcast.wordpress.com. So your RSS feed might be mypodcast.wordpress.com slash feed. You submit that to iTunes and to other podcast directories. Then you decide, I have saved up enough money to be able to pay $5 a month or so to have my own website. So I'm going to move off of wordpress.com and get my own website so I can have control over everything. So you move your website. Now, what happens to all of our, your RSS subscribers? They're still subscribed to mypodcast.wordpress.com slash feed. There are ways to work around that depending on who has that control over your feed. If you use Libsyn, for example, and you've been using Libsyn to host your website as well as your podcast media files, and you've given Libsyn's RSS feed to iTunes, there is a way that you can tell Libsyn to redirect everyone from using this feed to your new feed. But the problem is not everyone's podcast software will be updated. So you will always have to have that redirect in place or else you'll risk losing listeners. A couple people provided some feedback on this point. Wally's Modcast said, he said, sucks using WordPress.com because I cannot change my RSS. Uh, I'm sorry, Wally, but there, there might be a way someday that we can work around this. And also Eileen, or known as Miss Eileen Speaks, and she's got... Uh, basic blog tips and basic podcasting tips uh, dot coms on both of those by the way she added that using feed burner is an absolute must and uh, must be used from the start and people in the chat room when i do this live by the way on tuesdays no mondays at 2 p.m eastern time over at noodle.mx slash live several people in the chat room are agreeing yes feed burner is a must now here's where the disagreement comes in though there are companies out there that provide great plugins. Well, a company out there that provides a great podcasting plugin, and that is Blueberry provides the PowerPress plugin. Blueberry is ardently against FeedBurner. And I've talked with their CEO, Todd Cochran, and he shared some of why they're so against FeedBurner. And one of their reasons is that PowerPress does everything everything that you would need it to do to have a podcast from your blog and that FeedBurner is just an extra service that doesn't provide too much more benefit on top of what PowerPress can already do. And they would also say, if you want to be serious about podcasting, you should from the start get your own website, use your own RSS feed and all of that stuff. That's true, but that's not the way everyone starts. Not everyone can afford to get their own website at the beginning. Not everyone knows how to get their own website because the cost of entry to podcasting is time and knowledge, not so much money, but time and knowledge. And so you might start out somewhere where it's simple to do, but if you don't control your RSS feed, then you're stuck at that simple to do place. So using FeedBurner can work great for you. The The reason why I'm saying this helps you not be stuck is when you use FeedBurner, it gives you an RSS address called something like feeds.feedburner.com slash my podcast. And then in FeedBurner, you tell it where you want it to pull that RSS feed from. So that could be mypodcast.com slash feed, or it could be mypodcast.wordpress.com slash feed, or it could be any other RSS feed you want it to use. And anyone who's subscribed to feeds.feedburner.com slash my podcast will get whatever other content you give. So you could move your website around wherever you could rename your website and do whatever you want with the name, move things around, change media files, and your subscribers will never be unsubscribed from you as long as you maintain that same feed address. There, there are ways sometimes to rescue your feed, and some places there aren't ways to do it. 
So number one, and the most important point why I spent more time on it is control your RSS feed. Number two, launch with at least three episodes. Yes, you can launch a podcast and put it in multiple directories with as little as just one episode, but I really recommend that you have three episodes for a few reasons. Number one, it shows potential listeners that the show is already going strong. If you go out there and you publish size that you're starting this new podcast and all of this stuff and people rush to iTunes to get your podcast and they find one episode. It doesn't look like you're too serious. There's just one episode there. They may notice the date, but if there's just one episode, it doesn't look like you're going strong yet. And is it worth their time to listen to this if there's only one episode so far? Number two reason is greater likeliness of being featured in iTunes. Because in iTunes, there are certain secret algorithms for what gets you featured in iTunes. And being featured in iTunes is a great thing because it brings a lot of listeners to you. iTunes is the most popular uh, program that people use for subscribing to podcasts and finding podcasts. There are many others, but iTunes is the most popular one, so you definitely need to be in iTunes And it's fantastic if you can be visible and featured in iTunes. So having more than one episode when you launch helps with that because people will be downloading each of those episodes and that helps iTunes a little bit. Number three, it's more likely that you'll be accepted into more podcast directories when you have more than one episode. There is, I think it's the Blueberry podcast directory requires that you have at least three episodes, I believe, three or five episodes. And then they have other requirements too. Like if you want your podcast listed on the Roku box, which is a great benefit that Blueberry provides and certain other things, they require that you have at least seven episodes in your feed. So the more episodes you can have when you launch, the better. However, keep in mind that if you launch with too many episodes, people may miss your first few episodes. So you have to find that balance. I recommend three to five, no more than five, no fewer than three when you launch. So number one, control your RSS feed. Number two, launch with at least three episodes. And number three, have podcast cover art when you launch. Now I do design podcast cover art for people. You can go over to podcastcoverart.com and see examples of podcast cover art I've designed, and also learn a bit more about why podcast cover art is so important. When you launch your podcast, it's very easy to get so excited about launching it. You stick it up there. It's in iTunes, but you don't have an image yet, a cover art. This is what people see in iTunes or any other podcast directory when they look at your podcast. If you don't have an image there called a podcast cover art, Some other people call it podcast artwork or podcast album art. If you don't have an image there, then number one, it's going to look cheap. Number two, directories aren't going to feature that really at all. iTunes will never feature a podcast that has no artwork or just has the standard artwork, which is based on whatever you use to create your RSS feed. So it might be the Blueberry logo or it might be a FeedBurner logo or something iTunes will never feature that if you use that as your artwork. So have something nice. If you want something really nice, you can hire me. Go to podcastcoverart.com if you're interested in hiring me to design your podcast cover art. But have something there. It's it's okay if you need to change it later on, but make sure you have something good when you start out. And don't change it too often. Number four, keep your episode numbering simple. Eileen uh, from Miss Eileen Speaks and Jim Kerwin both shared some thoughts on episode numbering. And I'm going to let Jim Kerwin share his thoughts that he sent in as a voicemail to this about keeping your episode numbering simple. Hi, Daniel. This is Jim Kerwin from the kernelsofwheat.com podcast and the finest of the wheat.org Bible teaching site. When I started out, I wanted to use my first episode introducing the why and how of the kernelsofwheat.com podcast 
But since I teach expositionally through a book of the Bible, that is to say, verse by verse rather than hopping around, I didn't want the intro to be included in the numbering sequence. I wanted episode one to mark where we actually started teaching through the first epistle of John, not the pre-teaching introduction. So I labeled my first podcast as episode zero, not episode one. Don't do that. It seemed like a good idea at the time, but now every week I have to go through mental gymnastics. It's a small thing. I'm sure it wouldn't bother any other podcasters because they'll have more common sense than I do. But it will annoy me every single week, especially when I get near episode 100. Will I celebrate number 99 because it's the 100th, or will I celebrate number 100 even though it's the 101st episode? Thanks for all you do, Daniel. Thank you for that message, Jim, and that's a great point. First, don't start with episode zero. There are many reasons why you wouldn't want to start with the episode zero, and I'll talk more about that later on. But the episode numbering thing can be so, so frustrating for both you as the podcaster and for your listeners. This is one of the things where if you do it right and do it right from the beginning, it's easier for both of you. I'll give you the the example of my own podcasting mistake is with my podcast, Are You Just Watching?, which is currently on a, a break. When we started out, we would do these movie reviews that would end up actually being two episodes. So it would be split in half, part one and part two, which that alone, I don't really like that doing that as much anymore. But we would do this part one and part two, and it would be those would be our full episodes. So we would call those Are you just watching episode one and episode two and so on? And that would be a lot more thought gone into it, a lot more sound clips and a better outline. Then we started getting press passes to go see movies in theaters. Now, we can't record in a theater, so we can't get sound clips. We're only able to watch the movie once. So... We have to restrict what we can do. So it's more of an initial reaction or initial review of the movie. So we st- started doing these things we called initial reactions episodes. We wanted to distinguish that they were different from our regular episodes because we weren't getting as in-depth in reviewing the movie. And by the way, when I say reviewing the movie, we approach it from a Christian critical thinking perspective. That's over at areyoujustwatching.com. But when we would do it, we... We started with these separate numbering systems. So there was, are you just watching episode five? And are you just watching initial reactions episode five? And they did not line up. In fact, there were a couple times where the regular episode was released in two parts. And in between the two parts was initial reactions episode. Or I didn't want to release both parts too quickly or I didn't want to split them up like that with the initial reactions in between. And so I had to delay things because of how we said numbers. And it just got so complicated with the numbering system. And like Jim said, Jim's math is simple. He's just one off. With Are You Just Watching, we're, I think, 13 off. So when we say episode 20, it's actually our 33rd episode. I think that's how it works. I always have to go back. Whenever I fill out a survey or anything that says, how many episodes have we released? I always have to go back and actually count the MP3s in order to know how many episodes we have because of the split numbering system. And it makes it confusing for our listeners too. Not just frustrating for us as the podcasters, but for our listeners too, because when they download in their player, depending on which kind of podcast player or portable player they're using, it might be alphabetical instead of sorted by date, or you might not have tagged your MP3s properly with track numbers, or maybe you did. Maybe you have, like in our case, uh, a good example here is that we had episode 15 of Are You Just Watching at the same time as episode 8 of the initial reactions. So if you saw in your player AYJW, 15 and AYJW dash IR8, which by the way, that just, it was a mess to do that. 
a player might sort those incorrectly. It might put all of the in initial reactions together in one spot. And especially adding the track numbers to that, because that's a tag that you should add in your MP3 tags are track numbers. And I've posted an episode about that before. I'll have a link to that about MP3 tags in the show notes over at the audacity to podcast.com slash 68. But if you have those episodes each tagged, like in my case, 15 and eight, then an MP3 player is going to put them out of order and not in the order that they were actually released. I've seen other podcasts do this too. Even worse punishment is that they have in a single podcast, they, they have one podcast, but multiple numbering systems. So they're on like ABC one two, episode five and XYZ episode 20 and QRS episode 10 and all of this. And they're all released one right after the other. So it's, it's a pain for listeners because it, it looks like it's out of order and you don't really know which one is which and it's a pain for the producers. So get your numbering right the first time when you start out. I recommend start with episode one and keep everything about your podcast attached to that arbitrary sequential number. Next episode is two, next episode three. So then when you have released 100 episodes, you are on episode 100. That's the way I recommend doing it. And you can't change that after you've started. Like in my case with Are You Just Watching, since we're now 43 episodes into this, I think, I can't go back and change those other episodes to say, this is actually episode 12 because then that means I have to reflow things and I can't reflow things because they're, they're linked to certain episode numbers and all of this. It also makes it a pain for show notes URLs because you know I'm a big proponent of making show note URLs easy to get to. I always say the audacity to podcast.com slash 68. That's really easy and it's, it's very sequential. But on Are You Just Watching?, we used to have to say, are you just watching.com slash I R eight and are you just watching.com slash 10 and the dual numbering system just, it's a pain. Please don't go there. If you want to save your sanity and the sanity of your listeners, keep your episode numbering simple from the beginning because you really can't change that later on unless you want there to be a gap. I could, I've thought about this. I could just correct the episode numbers and with the next episode, just jump to say 43. But I know what would happen is I would get a lot of emails saying, where's episode number this or anything in between. So number one, control your RSS feed. Number two, launch with at least three episodes. Number three, have podcast cover art when you launch. Number four, keep episode numbering simple. And number five, offer standard formats iTunes popularized this thing, or in fact, they kind of created it, of enhanced podcasts, which are AAC files, so .m4a files, that's their extension, but they're considered AAC, that they offered some cool things to them, like chapter marking, so it could be really easy for someone listening on an iPod to just click next, and it would jump to the next section in your audio if they wanted chapters. And it had changeable cover art. So halfway through your episode, you could change it to say or display something relevant to what you're talking about. You could even include hyperlinks in this. Now, this all sounds great. Yeah. But I really think it's merely a novelty and it's not in high demand and it's not compatible either. You'll hear this from a listener later that he said he counts this in one of his big podcasting mistakes. Adding these extra chapter markings and changing the cover art and all of that is easy on OS X if you use GarageBand. On Windows, it's not so easy. There aren't many programs to do this. There's GarageBand on OS X, and for Windows, eh, not really much that's good. There is a program called PodReel, don't buy it because I don't recommend doing enhanced podcasts because 
when it really comes down to it, enhanced podcasts only work on iTunes or Apple mobile devices like iPods, iPhones, iPod touches, iPads. So don't even assume that just because you're in iTunes means that people downloading are going to want an enhanced podcast or have an Apple mobile device. Don't assume that kind of thing. Offer standard formats, like if you're doing an audio podcast, an MP3. It works on everything, works everywhere. Do that. If you want to spend the extra time to do an enhanced podcast, yeah, do that too. Make sure you label it as saying this requires iTunes or an Apple mobile device. But you're just creating extra work for yourself if you do that. So I don't recommend it. But if you really want to, do it as an extra to a standard format. But when you start, have just at least have the standard format. And that should be the primary place that you send people to subscribe is for your standard format. Otherwise, it just gets confusing. Number six, split your podcast and blog RSS feeds. When you have a podcast, you should also have a blog. Just as the home for your website and that every podcast episode you release has a blog post that goes along with it. I also recommend that you occasionally write some blog posts on that website, especially if you don't write good show notes. Because those blog posts can help people find your site and engage with your content in a way other than just audio. So if you are blogging, in addition to posting your podcast episodes, that is filling up your RSS feed. WordPress's default is to release 10 items in an RSS feed. So if you put that one all-inclusive RSS feed in iTunes and all other podcast programs, they'll only get to pull 10 items from your website. But most podcast programs will only pull what's actually a podcast from your feed. So if you've blogged five times and podcasted five times, then iTunes and other podcast software will only see five podcast episodes. They won't see 10 podcast episodes because those other five slots are being bumped out by your blog posts. So create a podcast-only RSS feed and submit that RSS feed to all of the podcast directories. There are two easy ways that you can do this. Well, before I mention that, let me mention one other thing that breaks if you use one feed for everything. So there's the blog posts bumping out the podcast episodes and your feed item limit. If you you might consider raising that limit to 100 posts, for example, in your RSS feed. Well, that's that might be okay, but then you might run into a problem that your RSS feed is too big. FeedBurner has a limit of 512 kilobytes. That's half a megabyte, which really, that is big. Regardless of what speed of the internet you have, that is big to be pinged every time to check if there's a new episode. That's too big. It really shouldn't be that big. But if you increase your limit to 100 items in your RSS feed, and it's all podcast episodes and blog posts, then it's really easy to hit that limit of 512K for your file size of the XML file that FeedBurner or WordPress is managing for you. If you hit that limit, your RSS feed won't work. So podcast subscribers won't get your latest podcast episode. So separating your feeds helps keep that limit down, and there are even ways that you can optimize your feed in FeedBurner so that it's much smaller for just that podcast subscription feed, so that it's giving just the bare essentials that a podcast subscription program needs. Then the third reason, or the third problem that happens if you're using a single RSS feed for everything is that you can't title your blog and your podcast separately. You might think that doesn't really matter, but what if you want to have the word blog or podcast in your title? Then you run into problems because you might have the totally awesome podcast is the name of your podcast. So that's what you want displayed in iTunes. 
But then on the blog, you also blog some totally awesome things. And so it's the totally awesome blog and podcast, or maybe just totally awesome blog. If you have a single RSS feed, you can't make those feeds titles change. It's always going to be one thing or the other. And having in iTunes a podcast say the totally awesome blog just doesn't make sense. It It's not the right place to say blog because iTunes and other podcast programs don't subscribe to blogs. They subscribe to podcasts. So the blog part is completely lost. It It doesn't need to be in there. So I recommend that you split your RSS feeds where one feed is everything from your site, your blog posts, and your podcast episodes. And then the other feed is just your podcast episodes. There are two and a half ways that you can do this. I say two and a half because the third way is kind of a merge between the two. Number one is you could put all of your podcast episodes in one category. So you could have in WordPress or any blogging software that you're using, you can have one category is blog and the other category is podcast. So you put everything in there. And if you have permalinks enabled on WordPress, then you can go to mypodcast.com slash category name slash feed. And it gives you the feed category name, by the way, replace that with whatever the name of the category is. In this case, we'll say it's podcast with the slash feed on it, gets the RSS feed from just that category. Then you could run that through FeedBurner and submit that into iTunes and all of the other podcast directories. And on top of this, if you want the ability for that feed of just your podcast episodes to contain more posts than the rest of your RSS feed contains, then get the posts per category plugin for WordPress. This is by Pat Flynn of Smart Passive Income, and he ran into a simpler, similar problem. Uh, there was another way around this other than what he did of paying someone to make this pro- plugin for him. But this is an easy way if you want to work with categories as offering your RSS feeds. So then you can go in and say this category's RSS feed will have 50 items But the whole site RSS feed will only have 20 items. That's what this plugin allows you to do. The other way of doing this is use Blueberry PowerPress, which I highly recommend you use anyway. And they offer in their settings, you can find a spot where they offer a podcast only feed. So this will pull podcasts from any category. You don't have to put podcasts in a podcast category. If you attach an episode to a post, PowerPress considers that a podcast episode, and so it puts it in this podcast-only feed. And in Blueberry PowerPress, you have the same ability to adjust how many episodes are released in that podcast-only feed. So for your website, instead of it being mypodcast.com slash a category name slash feed, it might be mypodcast.com slash feed slash podcast. It's a little bit different, but look at what Blueberry tells you your feed would be because it depends on how you have it configured and if you're doing channels or uh, category casting or any of this other stuff. But PowerPress gives you an address. It says, this is your podcast only feed. And you can use that, put it in FeedBurner, put that to all of your RSS subscriptions in uh, podcast directories. Then the third way, the hybrid of these two, is put all of your podcasts in the podcast category, make it easy and organized, and all of your blog posts can be in a blog category or can be in multiple categories, whatever. And by the way, in WordPress, you can put a single post in multiple categories. So you can do that for just the organization of it, putting all of your podcast episodes in a podcast category but then use PowerPress's podcast-only feed, and that saves you from having to install an extra plugin to adjust how many episodes are released in that podcast-only feed. Because Blueberry's PowerPress can do the same thing that posts per category can do in terms of how many episodes are released in the feed. So if you can do it with one plugin, I recommend doing that instead of doing it with two plugins. Keeps it easier to maintain and Blueberry is 
fantastic. And by the way, I'll mention something in a little bit about a new update that they have. So split your podcast and blog RSS feeds. This is something, again, you cannot fix this after you've started. I have some theories on ways this could be fixed, but it's not going to be pretty. It would essentially involve that you you have to tell people we're changing our feeds if you are subscribed to our podcast only feed in a an RSS reader like feed like a Feedly or Google Reader or some other program like that then please change your subscription to this address because what you're subscribed to is going to change into a podcast only feed but then you're asking your audience to do something that's inconvenient for them. And I hate doing that. I'm a web designer, so I focus on not forcing people to think when they get to my content and my uh, podcast. I don't want them to have to do convoluted processes and hard to do steps or just inconvenience them in order to stay subscribed. Because if you inconvenience someone, that's just a temptation for them to unsubscribe and forget it in the, in, altogether. So split your podcast and RSS feeds in the beginning. If you're wondering about the naming of it, the naming of your RSS feeds doesn't really matter. Here's what I've started doing. And if you go to oncepodcast.com, you'll see this is how I did it. And by the way, this thing, split your blog and podcast feeds, I didn't do that on the Audacity to Podcast. Everyone is subscribed to the same RSS address for the Audacity to Podcast. I messed up. And I can't fix it. So I'm this. Uh, this is a list of some of the mistakes I've made, and I can't fix now. But if you go to oncepodcast.com, which is my Once Upon a Time podcast about the TV show, you'll see that I have multiple links to the podcast in different directories. If you subscribe to the podcast from any podcast directory, you'll get feeds.feedburner.com/slash/oncepodcast-dash or hyphen mp3. That's what all the podcast directories get. But if you go to the site, you'll notice your browser may detect that there's an RSS feed on the site. Or you'll see the RSS feed button. That gets feeds.feedburner.com slash once podcast. The all-inclusive feed that includes blog posts, forum posts, and podcast episodes. So that would be great for someone to subscribe to in a program like Feedly or Google Reader or a NewsGator, or anything like that. Because then they'll see in their program the new podcast episodes, the new forum posts, the new po- uh, blog posts, so they can consume it all that way. I don't recommend that you have a blog-only feed. I think it should be an all-inclusive feed and a podcast-only feed. A blog-only feed, it's kind of unnecessary. Because some people like listening to podcasts through Google Reader. Or if someone listens to your podcast through Google Reader. It means if they get an Android phone and they have Google Listen, they can also listen to your podcast that way through that podcast software on Google Reader. So I recommend you have an all-inclusive and a podcast-only feed. So number one, control your RSS feed. Number two, launch with at least three episodes. Number three, have podcast cover art when you launch. Number four, keep episode numbering simple. Number five, offer standard formats. Number six, split podcast and blog RSS feeds. And number seven, have and use your own domain. Now, regardless of where you host your podcast website from the start, and by the way, you better have a podcast website. (laughs) No matter where you host it, get your own domain. They're only $12 or $12 to $15 per year. And in some cases, like WordPress, you can make your WordPress.com site use your own domain for $17 per year. So it may look like you have your own website, but you're actually still being hosted at WordPress.com. So regardless of where your website is, how it's hosted or anything, have your own domain name and use it. Tell people about it. Tell people to get to your podcast through that domain. Don't tell people, visit mypodcast.wordpress.com. No, tell them, visit mypodcast.com. It sounds a lot better if it's on business cards and emails and all of that a whole lot better. It looks a lot more professional, and then it might forward to your new address. Now, if you someday decide to change where your website is hosted, 
and you have all of these podcast business cards or emails or all of this stuff all over the world that's linking to mypodcast.com and you change your hosting to use your own website address on your own hosting account using mypodcast.com, you don't have to reprint anything. Everyone just starts going to your new site. I do recommend though, if you ever move from wordpress.com or another site, try your best to redirect people. If there's not an official way that the free service can actually redirect people where if they click a link, it takes them somewhere else, then just start putting up posts, letting people know this content is moved to here. And there might be some way that you can work around that. But again, this is why I'm saying uh, it's kind of one of those things you need to get right in the beginning or else it can be a little painful. And in our chat room, Troy's story has mentioned that this is exactly what he did. He got completelycomics.com and it sounds a lot better than saying completelycomics.wordpress.com. And so he he uses that domain and that's what he tells people to go to. And it sounds a whole lot better and a lot more professional too to use your actual domain. By the way, if you want some, uh, some suggestions on web hosting, I recommend... Bluehost, HostGator, or Site5. And I have affiliate links for each of those. And again, you can get those over in the show notes for this episode at theaudacitypodcast.com slash 68. Or I have some instructions about hosting recommendations over at theaudacitypodcast.com slash 58. So have and use your own domain. And then going right along with that, number eight, make a branded email address. When you have your domain, even if it's just forwarding to something else like a wordpress.com site, use that domain for your email address. It looks more professional, it sounds more professional, and it's more portable, it's more flexible too. So this would be something like feedback at mypodcast.com instead of something like almost my podcast name at yahoo.com. Because you know what happens? Quite frequently, what you use for your domain is could already be taken by Google or Yahoo or someone else out there already got it. Like someone else has the ramen noodle at gmail.com. I don't know who it is. They registered their account account shortly after I started the podcast. So I don't know if they tried to steal it from me or what, but someone else has that, but that's fine. I've never, ever told people to email any Gmail address. I've usually had, I've always had an actual domain email address. Now I've changed that a couple times because you might remember if you've been a longtime listener of The Ramen Noodle over at cleancomedypodcast.com, then you might know that in the beginning I told people email me at theramennoodle.com. Then I changed it to feedback at noodle.mx. When I launched the Noodle Mix Network, I had all the email going into the same place. Then I realized that was starting to get hard to manage because I didn't know what the emails were about right away just by glancing at my inbox because everything really here's a little secret every email address you've ever had for me in existence or ever seen well number one it still works but they all go to the exact same gmail account it's just a catch-all for everything and i love it that way i'll explain more how to do that in a later episode but now i use feedback at the noodle.com or feedback at cleancomedypodcast.com. They both work. Or I have now feedback at each of my podcast names.com. And it's so much better branded than saying almost my podcast name at yahoo.com. It it works a lot better. It sounds a lot better. And it's so much more flexible because if you have that set up as a forwarder, where it's really easy to do and it's often free to do with your $12 a year domain account or maybe it's a goes along with your web hosting account you can tell it to forward all that email to another account and it's pretty easy to set it up so that you can even send as if it's coming from that email address without having to create a separate email address i don't like using yahoo or i mean not yahoo but a, an email program like Outlook or Entourage or Apple Mail or anything like that 
I don't like using those extra programs, creating new email accounts. I hate logging out of Gmail and logging into another email account. I don't want to mess with setting up multiple email accounts. So I have all of my stuff forwarding from feedback at mypodcastdomain.com to a single email account, and I have it set up so I can send from each of those email addresses too. And I'll talk about that. I have a whole episode just about that, how you can set that up in the future. So when these things are set up, it's, it's better helping your branding and it's more memorable to people because if they want to email you, they know your website address. They probably instantly know your email account as well. So do this right in the beginning because otherwise people are going to hear multiple email addresses out there. I helped another podcaster recently over a trademark issue that they were using an email address at a email provider like Gmail, Yahoo, Hotmail, that kind of thing. They were using an email address that was infringing on someone else's trademark. And they had already recorded audio intros and bumpers and business cards and all of this stuff that had that email address on it that was using someone else's email provider, someone else's branding like Gmail, Yahoo, or Hotmail or something like that, AOL.com, instead of their own. So I helped them a little bit change that to now it's feedback at their podcast.com. And that's the address they're publishing. They still use the old address, but now the public sees that nice address. And it's easy for them too because they can have all of that forwarded to their regular email account instead of logging out, logging in, or setting up extra email accounts in their email programs. So make a branded email address. Number nine, use a media host or not. This is very subjective. A media host would be someone like Libsyn or Blueberry who offers truly unlimited bandwidth for a limited amount of storage. So in Libsyn's case, their lowest package is 50 megabytes per month. You can upload as much as 50 megabytes of stuff, but it can be downloaded from an unlimited number of people. It could be downloaded by just your mom, or it could be downloaded by billions of people, and you still pay only one amount per month. This is great because that's what they're designed for, is hosting your media so that an unlimited number of people can download it per month. If you're going to use a media host, and if you're going to have a popular podcast, then I recommend that you get your media host in the beginning. But you also need to be honest about how popular your podcast will get. Be realistic in what you expect, because you might think, oh, I'm going to launch this podcast. It's going to be the most amazing thing ever. It's going to be on the front page of iTunes and Steve Jobs himself will rise from the dead and he will declare that my podcast is the best podcast ever in the world and everyone will subscribe to it. And then you podcast for three years and you never break the 100 mark. That can be discouraging. Yes, that is. I've been there before. It can be discouraging. Just keep in mind, you are speaking regularly to 100 people who are interested enough in your opinions that they stay subscribed. So it's not without its perks. And it's very great to have 100 faithful listeners who provide feedback. But if you only have 100 people downloading your episodes, then you don't really need to pay the extra to host your media files somewhere. Now, there's always that thing of what if your podcast gets popular? And that's part of why you really need to have realistic expectations. What you could do instead of paying someone is you could... Host your media at archive.org, which I highly recommend against because it's slow and it's really a pain to host stuff with them. Like if you want to change your media file, you can't just change it. You have to upload a new one and link to your new one instead of the old one. So you can't just replace a file that's on it. Once it's on it, it's there. But then the other thing is you could potentially host your media files with your website host, but make sure you ask them first if you're allowed to do that. Some places won't like it if you're hosting media on them, but make sure they know it's you own the copyrights and this is linked to from your website. And they'll probably be okay with it uh, 
if you're not too popular. When you get popular, they're not going to be okay with it. So do that with caution, but pick something that works from the beginning because otherwise it can be hard to switch later on. If you've released 100 episodes and then suddenly you get popular, it can be really hard to move those 100 episodes to a premium service that takes care of your bandwidth for you. Number 10, encode your files well. If you use a media host, your monthly storage is limited. Like in the case of Libsyn, it's 50 megabytes a month. So if you start podcasting at, I'll say 256 kilobits per second in stereo, you're going to fill up your monthly storage very quickly. So instead, I recommend encoding your files at 64 kilobits per second mono for most podcasts that seems to work because it's just speaking and they really don't need the stereo. So if 64 kilobits mono is the same quality as 128 kilobits stereo. I have more information about whether you should podcast in mono or stereo over at the audacity to podcast.com slash 59. Doing so will save space and bandwidth and all of that. But the reason why it's important for you to get get this right in the beginning is you might not be able to go back and replace those files. Especially if you have uh, a, a poorly encoded system where it's not the most compatible, like variable bitrate. I used to say variable bitrate was the way to go until I actually did more research on it and realized, no, it's not the most compatible. So if you've released your first 20 episodes in variable bitrate, and people have tried to subscribe to your podcast and listen to those first few episodes, and it doesn't work on their player, then they've probably unsubscribed. So you need to get this right at the beginning. I recommend 64 kilobits per second mono or 128 kilobits per second stereo. Encode it with iTunes. Export it from Audacity or whatever your program is as Wave, and use iTunes to create your MP3s. And it creates a nice sounding file that's not too big, but it's very compatible. So encode your files well from the beginning. 11. Write at least basic show notes for your podcast episodes. If all that you do is release episode 1, episode 2, episode 3, and your actual show notes, like the blog post that goes along with that episode, just simply says download, listen, subscribe, all of that, that's not going to help you. What you write now on your website are words, and those words are very powerful to Google and other search engines. So what you're writing now is building your website reputation for a month from now, a year from now, and even farther from that. I am still getting a lot of hits on my website, not hits, visits on my website from things I wrote a couple years ago because I wrote enough information that it made it stand out to Google search engines. In fact, I have someone right now in the chat room from Florida, his name is Mike, that came to my website looking for some stuff. He searched Google, he found my website and saw just so happened that I was podcasting live right when he was on my website. So he decided to come over in the chat room and hang out. And this is just the content that he needs because he's looking at starting a podcast. So... He found my website because of the words I used in my show notes years ago, probably. And so what you write down now affects your Google and search engine reputation for later. Write something that makes sense, that's logical, even if it's just a simple bullet point list of your topics. Do this from the beginning because If a year from now you decide, I'm going to get serious about search engine optimization, that's a whole year of what they call Google juice that could have been building up that you lost because you didn't write decent show notes. Even if it's just the basic bullet points, that can help you out. So start that out at the beginning because you can't really easily fix it later on. If you do try and fix it, It's just going to take a while for Google to update and for you to get that juice that you want that you could have had after a year. Number 12, reserve social accounts with your brand. I've made this mistake many times where I started using some kind of brand or a trademark, really, uh, 
but I didn't reserve it in all of the right places. Some of these places to go for when you name your podcast, make a Facebook page, get the 25 people on it and register the name. Get a YouTube channel, a Twitter account, of course, the domain names. You don't want someone to steal your domain names like someone did to me recently. (laughs) And get the email addresses or email address in multiple services like Gmail or Yahoo or whatever matters to you and any other social network IDs that you think are important. Register your name there, even if it's not going to be important. If you're never going to use YouTube, still get the YouTube channel name so that if you ever do, you could use that. Or if you never do, at least you'll have the assurance that no one is going to steal your trademark. In order to protect a trademark, you have to demonstrate that you've been trying to protect your trademark. And by the way, here's another lesson I learned recently. Bonus tip. If you have something that you want to consider a trademark on your website, add the little trademark symbol to it, the TM. That's the unregistered trademark symbol. The R with the circle around it is a registered trademark, but the TM is an unregistered trademark. That way it just indicates to people, yes, you are claiming this as a trademark. And you'll notice now on all of my podcast websites, I have now added the TM to every single, almost every single mention of the podcast or blog name because I want to make it obvious to people I'm claiming these as a trademark. Number 13, start strong and on topic. I don't recommend an episode zero. We talked, I mentioned this just a little bit earlier. Only your first listeners will hear it. But if you have an episode zero, that's not actually your content. That's more an introduction of who you are and what the podcast is going to be. It can turn away your prospective listeners because you're not actually sharing your content. So I don't recommend an episode zero and maybe not even an introduction Uh, podcast episode. Most podcasts don't need a full episode as the introduction, but should instead be introducing the podcast in every episode or like a reminder at the beginning of every episode. You hear me do this. When I started this podcast, I said, this is a how-to podcast about podcasting and using Audacity. This is where I give you the guts and teach you the tools to podcast with passion, organization, and dialogue. That's my introduction to the podcast. I'm explaining what the podcast is in just a couple short sentences. Because if you release your introduction episode as episode zero or episode one, and then you're a hundred episodes later, your new subscribers will have no idea who you are, what the podcast is about, and they'll be trying to figure out what you are, who you are about, or they'll read your description, but include your description every time at the beginning of your episode so that people get to know what it is. Some podcasts, though, do need that introduction episode. Like if they're covering a deeper topic that has that requires some kind of fundamental knowledge, then that's a good thing to start as a first episode. Make it episode one, not zero, one. And then keep referring back to that. Like this is what I do in Are You Just Watching is our first episode was what is critical thinking? It was our introduction episode. We didn't talk about a movie. We talked about why critical thinking was important when watching movies. So we're still talking, we're addressing our content, but it was very much an introduction episode. Now, almost every episode since then, I review with people saying critical thinking is blah, 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 blah. For more information to learn more about what critical thinking is in movies, go back to episode one and listen to that and then come back and listen to this current episode. So I'm referring back to it as a reference. And that's what you should do. If you have an introduction that's that important, then it should be its own episode, and you should be referring back to it as often as you can. And when you start, though, also consider that you need to start your podcast with strong content and being on topic don't have a bunch of these introduction episodes or several episodes before you actually get into your content. Despite how precise I was with my marketing of the Audacity to podcast, it was still misunderstood by many people. And people thought that it was going to be a podcast exclusively about Audacity or podcasting with Audacity and nothing else. So I took 
five episodes before I started talking about Audacity. And that meant I lost some listeners because they came looking for a podcast about Audacity and I didn't even mention Audacity. Well, I mentioned it maybe, but I didn't talk about it or tell anything about Audacity for several episodes. So this turned away some listeners and it also got some negative reviews from some potential listeners saying, he's so many episodes into this and he hasn't even mentioned Audacity. I'm not listening anymore. Maybe that person is still listening if they are then maybe they could remove their iTunes review. (laughs) No, but it's very true. I waited too long to get into the content that people were expecting. So start strong with your podcast. Overall, your first few episodes should be strong. That don't expect your first few episodes to be perfect. I'm not saying that even in every podcast that you start, you're probably always going to struggle finding your niche and finding your flow of the episodes in the first few episodes, but start as strong as you can and start with your topic and stay on topic as early as you can. And then the last thing, number 14, well, let me review. Number one, control your RSS feed. Number two, launch with at least three episodes. Number three, have podcast cover art when you launch. Number four, keep episode numbering simple. Number five, offer standard formats. Number six, split podcast and blog RSS feeds. Number seven, have and use your own domain. Number eight, make a branded email address. Number nine, use an email or use a media host or not. Number 10, encode your files well. Number 11, write at least basic show notes. Number 12, reserve social accounts for your brand. Number 13, start strong and on topic. And number 14, this is a bonus recommended thing, not required, but I do highly recommend is skip a USB mic and buy a mixer and a real mic, like an XLR mic. The reason I say that is that USB mics are not upgradable. So if you get a USB mic now, and later on you decide you want to add some things to your workflow, you're not going to be able to do it with a USB mic. A USB mic cannot connect to a mixer. So if you ever think you might need a mixer someday, don't get a USB mic. Even if you don't, it's so inexpensive to get a mixer and a basic dynamic microphone. Like I've mentioned before, you can get a Behringer 302 USB or a Behringer 502 USB for $50 or $40 respectively. And then you could get a standard on stage microphone from like Natty, that's N A D Y, it might be Natty, for a microphone stand and cable for $30. So for about $80, you can have the basic core equipment that you need to start. That's even upgradable too. You could upgrade just the mixer, keep the microphone, upgrade just the microphone, keep the mixer. You could add a microphone maybe depending on which mixer you get or add a computer or sound effects or Skype or anything like that. It's a lot easier if you start out right. Now it's not required. If all you ever do is a solo podcast, then a USB mic is probably fine. But I do recommend that you start out with better equipment because it's more expensive to try and correct that later on. One last thing to share on this is I put out the call for people to submit their ideas of different content, and much of that was incorporated into that. Chris Cowan sent in a list of his podcast regrets, and I've had to edit this down for brevity, but here is Chris Cowan's list, or Cohen's list. Hey, Daniel, this is Chris Cowan from breakroomstudios.com. I just wanted to share some of the mistakes I made when I first started my very first podcast. The first mistake I made was... When I submitted my uh, podcast to iTunes, I used the actual iWeb RSS feed rather than uh, going through FeedBurner first. And also, I I eventually changed from my original podcast name, which was The Madcast, I changed to No Show. A second mistake I made was after I moved from iWeb, I used a a new software to publish uh, called Podcast Maker. But the problem is, it doesn't generate a blog. So when I publish from Podcast Maker, it'll create the RSS feed, but there's no actual blog page to visit for show notes, links, or extra content. Uh, Another technical thing I did was I uh, started my original podcast, The Madcast, as an enhanced podcast, but the problem is it wasn't compatible with most other podcast catchers, and uh, there's, you know, kind of compatibility issues. 
other than the, the technical issues, when I first started, I, I didn't have a specific purpose to the podcast. Uh, I just, you know, kind of had a variety show uh, format with no clear intention. It's fine for hobbyists, but it's not for people hoping to garner a lot of interest. Also, uh, I, when I first started out, I didn't use detailed show notes to plan out the show. I, I kind of just flew by the handle, which often worked out okay, but sometimes we just had an episode we were recording and we kind of ran out of things to talk about. And finally, um, uh, like I said, my first podcast was called The Madcast. Uh, the second podcast was called No Show. And neither of those names for podcasts really tell you much about what the show is all about. So uh, that, those are uh, my uh, bits of advice, and obviously I'm, I'm still learning a lot. Just want to say uh, thanks for the show. It's uh, great. I'm, I'm learning a lot through uh, your show, so thanks a lot. Thank you very much for that message, Chris. And sorry, I had to edit down for brevity. But Chris had a great list there of things that uh, he's struggling with. And I've struggled with many of those things too. And I'm sure many of you out there can probably say, yep, I've done that too. So check out this full list of the 13 slash 14 things that you need to get right the first time. And if you're thinking about launching a new podcast or starting your first podcast, Look at this list closely and consider doing things the right way the first time so you don't have to fix it later on. If I missed anything on this list or if you want to talk about any of these points, I'd love to hear from you. The great place to go to discuss these things is go to the show notes over at theaudacitytopodcast.com slash 68 and then you can podcast there and we can discuss it so that other people will get to see what is being said about the content and participate in the conversation as well. You can also email me directly if you have some questions or feedback that you want included on the podcast. Email feedback at theaudacitytopodcast.com or you can go to now theaudacitytopodcast.com and click the send a voice message tab. That's a new service I'm using by SpeakPipe. By the way, if you want to learn more about them, check out the audacity to podcast.com slash speak pipe. It's free now. I recommend you check it out. It's really cool. I like it. Just some other podcasting news. Oh, by the way, phone number 903-231-2221. Some other podcasting news is that Blueberry has released PowerPress 3.0. And I'll mention more about this later or write a blog post about it. But some of the coolest things that you can do with PowerPress 3.0 is you can now upload your own play button image, which you've seen on my site that I just changed something in the plugin backend so that we could have I could have my own image that's not just this tiny little square play button, but it actually has a play button and it says, listen to the podcast. That's for HTML5 uh, compatible browsers. We'll see that. So I added it that there. Now you can do that officially with the plugin is you can upload your own image that you want to use. That's fantastic. The other thing that's really cool is they've got this new service called Meta Marks or Meta Marks is really the nail in the coffin for enhanced podcasts. It can provide the same functionality as an enhanced podcast if people are watching or listening on your blog or for compatible players out there. It's a really cool thing. It's not catching on yet. I don't really think it needs to, but if it's something that you really want, check it out. Last bit of podcasting news is the Double Twist Player, which is known as a great alternative for iTunes. There are many other alternatives, but the mobile version, at least the Android mobile version, now supports podcast streaming for free. So make sure your podcast is in the Double Twist Player. I will have a separate blog post about that coming up as well over at the audacity to podcast.com. So make sure you go over to the audacity to podcast.com, subscribe to the feed to get the uh, episodes and the blog posts, subscribe to it in a feed reader, or you can also subscribe, also subscribe in the email box over on the right side to get podcasting tips and updates and all of that. So thank you very much for listening to this episode. And I know I went a bit long, but there's a lot more information to cover and words to say than I thought. But I would love to hear from you what stuff you want me to cover, what kind of audacity questions you have or podcasting questions that you're facing. 
Email feedback at the audacity to podcast.com. Call 903-231-2221 or go to the audacity to podcast.com and you can send a message from the website and even send a voice message from the website. Also get the links that I mentioned and show notes and so much more over at the audacity to podcast.com slash 68. And if you would, please leave a nice rating or review in iTunes or whatever podcast directory you found me by. And I have links to multiples of those over at the audacity to podcast.com slash. Well, just yeah, dot com. <laughs> Follow me on twitter.com slash the ramen noodle. And I hope to hear from you very soon. Now that, I, that I've given you some of the guts and taught you some of the tools, it's time for you to go podcast with passion, organization, and dialogue. I'm Daniel J. Lewis. Thank you for listening. The Audacity to Podcast is a proud member of the Noodle Mix Network. Find more of our podcasts like Clean Comedy, Christian Movie Reviews with Critical Thinking, Christian Worldview, Once Upon a Time, and more to come over at noodle.mx. The Audacity to Podcast is also a proud member of the Tech Podcast Network, where there are a whole bunch of podcasts about technology. So check those out at techpodcasts.com, and they are all family-friendly too, which I appreciate. So check it out, techpodcasts.com.